Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Calvin Bruce. Uh, I'm a family doctor in town. I'm on the planning committee. My main job is to uh, make sure that the microphone setting is working right. <laughs> I'm going to start by introducing uh, Mr. John Rosenfeld, who's the president of St. Mary's Hospital Medical Center, uh, and I'll turn it over to him. Welcome on uh, behalf of St. Mary's. Uh, we are very proud to have, uh, have this event at our organization. Uh, falls is something we take very seriously. Um, clearly today it's about how to avoid falls, so you don't need our care at St. Mary's. Uh, but if you do, we're certainly here to, to care for you. When you come to a hospital, you're here to be healed, not harmed. And therefore, we do everything in our power to make sure that you don't fall. Um, St. Mary's, um, about two years ago, implemented a national program called the Hester Davis Fall Prevention Program. And it's a program that identifies people through a screening tool, and then we put measures into place to make sure you're safe. We were the first hospital within SSM, which is now 27 hospitals, to implement this program, and it's now been implemented in all 27 hospitals across four states within SSM. I am pleased to report that after the implementation of this program, we saw approximately an 80% decrease with falls with harm. So that's falls that result in harm. Thank you. So anything we can do to help you learn about the risks of falls and prevent those in the first place, we're very happy to partner with the rest of the organizations here today so you can learn how to, how to remain healthy. So with that, glad you're all here. Thank you and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you, John. Actually, John, before you leave, I wanted, I wanted uh, to say uh, a special thank you to some St. Mary's staff who really helped us with this event. Uh, John Petty, Ruth Meyer, Jane Pratt, and uh, Jim Korth, and also a guy named Lemuel who's figuring out all the audiovisual stuff. Uh, so so the, the St. Mary's staff has really been great. Okay. Now, without further introduction, I'm going to introduce a guy who needs no introduction, Dr. Zorba Pastor. What a crowd. You're definitely a crowd. So I want to thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, by the way, I realize I am a rock star in the senior citizen group. <clears throat> I mean, when I speak to 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds, they don't think about health. I'll tell you what I think about. They think about a three-letter word begins with S and ends with X. But they don't necessarily think about the five-letter word F-A-L-L-S. They have a totally different, totally different thought. How many of you listen to public radio? So I just want to tell you, for those who haven't turned on public radio, it is a gem. I'm on public radio, 970 AM. You remember AM? You remember the cars only had AM in it back in the day? That's when cell phones didn't exist. And if you missed a call on the phone, you didn't know where it came from. But anyway, 970 AM, 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday and 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday. I just want to mention that. Um, I also, for those of you, how many read? <laughs> <coughs> And how many of you read the newspaper? You know, it's on paper, you hold it in your hand, you can take it with you, read it in the bed, then you have to recycle it. It's not electronic, but you can pick it up. It has great advantages. But I have a newspaper column, as many of you know, on Sunday, <clears throat> it's on Sunday, in, uh, in the Wisconsin State Journal. And very interestingly, I am not a writer at all. Miss Schutte, the teacher that I had in fourth grade, sixth grade and eighth grade told me that I never knew how to write. She was not my favorite teacher. She sort of was in the background. Luckily, she was old when I had her as a child, and so therefore she is not around anymore, which is kind of wonderful. But then, 
One day about four or five years ago when I was asked at the State Journal would I like to write a column and I discovered that I really could write a column. I did not think I had the ability or talent to do something. And I mention that because that has a lot to do with what I want to talk to you about today. It's not that I'm getting you to write a medical column to compete with me in the newspaper, but what you think you can't do, you actually can do. But what is the first step when we look at health and longevity? And that's kind of what I want to put on. The first step is hope. Hope. Hope for the future. Now, hope is not a plan. Let me repeat that. Hope is not a plan. <clears throat> it's different from optimism. Hope is when I fall down, which we don't want you to do, I'm going to pick myself, brush myself off, and start all over again. Well, the goal, of course, today is for you not to fall down. So when we look at hope, why should you ever take action in the first place? Let's look at it broadly on what produces longevity. So first of all, let's talk about longevity. When Ike was president, you remember the buttons, I like Ike? Yeah. Yeah. Of course you do. Most of you remember. You may have been too young to vote. I came from a split family. My mother voted straight Democratic. My father voted straight Republican, and we never discussed politics at home. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be dinner on the table, and uh, garbage wouldn't be taken out. But anyway, when, if we compare longevity from when Ike was president to now, we, have made t we are living 10 years longer than we did when Eisenhower was president, and that's mostly due to mid-age strength. 10 years longer. There's never been a time in the United States, in the world, where we have ever achieved that. Why have we achieved that? Whole bunch of things. Number of things. Number of things. We don't smoke as much. 49% of the men, 35% of the women smoke during that time, so we don't have the greatest toxin we have. We eat better. It used to be meat and potatoes. You know, vegetables used to be a little corn, a little iceberg lettuce, a little salad in there. Nothing really very good. We never ate very much. We have great technology. We treat high blood pressure. We used to think the blood pressure would be, you know, when you got older, your blood pressure simply went up and so on. But we don't think about falls, and yet falls are a major, major issue. So I want to give you some very interesting statistics that I looked up. I'm a numbers guy, so I always like to look some of these things up. So I was looking. OK. When you look at falls, you find out that Wisconsin is right up there in falls, right up there. Wisconsin, Minnesota. Now, we may laugh at this and we may say, well, it's due to the fact that we drink too much brandy old fashioned sweets. Well, of course, it may be due somewhat to some people who drink brandy old fashioned sweet. We know we are the highest consumers of brandy in the country and probably in the world. But it's not simply due to that. It's not simply due to that at all. So here are the numbers 15,000 people a year die from falls. 15,000. Now, it's roughly 20, 25,000 die of prostate cancer. You hear about prostate cancer all the time. We don't think about falls. Why? Good question. We talk about prostate cancer. We have runs for prostate cancer. We have money to increase awareness for prostate cancer. When was the last time you saw let's run for falls as a marathon? We don't see it. It's not sexy. It's not in there. The big C is something we think about, but we're missing something directly in front of our face. And that is false. Now, in Dane County, there were 2 million ER visits. Two mi not in Dane County, in the United States. 2 million ER visits. In Dane County, 30 people died of falls. 30 people. That's the estimation last year in Dane County. There were 11 murders in Dane County that we know of. There were 20 suicides in Dane County. More people died of falls in Dane County than murders and suicides combined. And we're not doing anything about it. Why is it? I don't know. It's a good question. That's why you're here. So one of the things that I think is very important, I wrote a book called The Longevity Code, Your Personal Prescription for a Longer, Sweeter Life. I knew when I wrote the book, if I wrote Your Personal Prescription for a Long, Awful Life, no one would ever buy the book. And we sold about 50000 which is really very good within the book business, and, and I did a PBS show. And within that, I talked about what I call five spheres of wellness physical sphere, a family and social sphere, a mental sphere, a spiritual sphere, whatever nourishes your heart and your soul, and a material sphere. And if you look at all five of those together, you will live what I call the long, sweet life. Very, very important. So I want to go, before I talk about falls and where it fits in here, I want to talk about dementia. My mother died of Alzheimer's disease, maybe. She died of dementia back in 1981. 
and I look back in the records, we don't really know what form of dementia she died from. So I have good news on the dementia front that influences what you're going to do today. Very good news. If we look at the Framingham Heart Study, the Framingham Heart Study is this massive study from Framingham, Massachusetts, where everyone basically in the city, pretty much, signed up for the study now 40, uh, 50 years ago, and there's Framingham too, and they looked at longevity issues. And then what they wanted to look is the incidence and prevalence of dementia before 1980, okay, in the 70s and beneath that. That's what we're comparing it to, okay? And they looked at new incidence of dementia, okay? Here's the data. New incidence of dementia from 1980 to 1990, how many reported dementia? There was a 23% drop in the new incidence of dementia. From 1990 to 2000, there was a 33% drop in the new incidence of dementia. In all groups but one, and I'll tell you what the one group was. From, 19, from the year 2000 to 2010, there's a 44% drop in the new incidence of dementia. Taken together, those 30 years, there was a 35, 34, 35% drop in the new incidence of dementia in all groups but one, high school dropouts. High school dropouts have the same prevalence of dementia today as they did in 1975, 1965, 1955, probably right back down to, to Dwight Eisenhower. Why is that? And this, this has something with what you're doing today. Why is that? Well, first of all, we don't know exactly what it is, but we can have a peek because this is observational. High school dropouts are more likely to smoke, less likely to eat well, not likely to exercise, not likely to read and be involved with their health, not, uh, less likely to wear seat belts, more likely to drink more alcohol. You can go all the way down the line. It's lifestyles issues, it's paying attention to what you're doing issues, and it's, uh, and, it's, and it's health issues. Now the reason why that's important for you today is when you learn about your health, you are doing something with your brain and actually not just improving your ability not to fall, but actually reducing the chances that you will have dementia. But it's just like a seatbelt. A seatbelt does not prevent you from having a car accident. A seatbelt means you're more likely not to have a fatal car accident. Lifelong learning means you're more likely to have less dementia or be able to get around that dementia, multiple strokes and so on, as long as you're learning. And that's what you're doing today. So what does this have to do with falls? Well, as I said, we have five different spheres. We have a physical space, a mental space, family and social space, spiritual space, and a material space. Now, I happen to be one of the physicians for His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, I've been involved in Tibetan causes for many years, since 1968. Yes, I'm only 39. <laughs> oh, good old Jack Benny. I remember when I was a kid listening to him thinking, why are my parents laughing? And now I laugh when I think about it when he says I'm 39. But I, I take care of His Holiness. When His Holiness comes to America, I arrange for all of his medical care in, in America. He exercises 30 minutes a day. He pays attention to his health and wellness. If the Dalai Lama can exercise 30 minutes a day, what's your excuse, <laughs> right? His schedule is much more, much more than yours. But the answer then ultimately is for you to take some of the things that you're gonna learn today and do today and reduce the chances that you will have a fall. So I wrote a column on this in the newspaper, for those of you who read, uh, in the newspaper. <laughs> this last week, and I want to go over the things that I did in the column, because I, I thought they were interesting. So I, I actually want to read about it and go on it, and then, then I'll let you get on with your things. So the first step I said is think. Think. I have a great book I love to cook called Rumen's 20, uh, and Rumen is, is a great chef, and his first chapter was think. It's very important. We spend more time often thinking about what LCD screen we want to buy, what cell phone we want to buy, where we're going to go on vacation, and we don't sit around and think about improving our health. We just don't do it. Why? It's not advertised. It does, it's not sexy. I don't know why. We just don't think. So when you're thinking about a reduction of falls, the first question is think. The second question is reviewing your physical space. And they're going to talk about it. Are there throw rugs? Yes, they look pretty. 
but they're not pretty if you fall, hurt yourself. If you fall, fracture your hip at your age, almost everyone here, there is a 50% chance you will be disabled in one or more major activity of your life, the ability to do things, and a 25% chance you will be dead within two to three years. 25% chance of death. Fall down, fracture your hip. P.K. Wrigley, somebody who was rich, really rich, at 65, 67 rather, fell down, broke his hip, he was dead in two years. <clears throat> it's a common cause of death. Remember, I told you, more common in Dane County than murders and suicides combined. And you can prevent it. But the first step is think. The second step is looking at your physical space. I tell people when they look at their physical space, you know, it's just like child-proofing. We have to adult-proof our physical space. We want to look around, make sure there are enough lights around. Are they brighter? Sure, there was, there was lighting that you like to have. We have lighting around our house to look around outside, and I thought it was really pretty. Well, in my 30s, the lighting was much lighter than it is now. <laughs> The lighting actually is the same. My eyes are not the same. So I had to put lights in and realize that. But that's one of the things you'll go over today. You want to look at your personal space is the next step. Not just the physical space you're living in, but your personal space. What is your physical space life? You're going to learn that today. You're going to learn how to take action, how to join groups. Remember, there's a social sphere. There's, a, there's something that's genuinely good about working in a group with other people who also want to stay well. Why? It's encouraging. It helps with hope. And once again, hope springs eternal, but hope is not a plan. Very, very important. The next step that I want you to do is review your pills with your doctor, with your pharmacist. Review your pills. What in your medicines may make you dizzy? What may interact? As soon as you're on six or more medications a day, there are issues with interactions of those medications. Talk to your pharmacist. Pharmacists are a wellspring of information to go on your medications. Doctors do not know the interactions as well as pharmacists, believe me. The pharmacist, that's their job, that's what they do, that's what they like to do. You want to look and see to make sure that you're on the right medications at the right time. That you minimize the amount of opioids, you minimize the amount of certain sleep medications so that you can do. Those are really the important things to do from a medication point of view. I want to talk about something else. I want to make a little side here about medications. I had a patient in my office the other day, this was probably two weeks ago, and he let me, I always ask people if I can tell their story to get permission, and he gave me permission. So he's on an antidepressant, has been on an antidepressant for years. Paxil, very, very good drug. He's a senior citizen. He said, please don't give me a 90-day supply because I can only afford a 30-day supply. Paxil is on the $4 a month pill in uh, Walmart. I just know that. So I said, you only want a 30-day supply. I was thinking, you know, it's, it's $4. He said, well, it cost me $38 a month when I give them my copay card on my insurance. I said, oh, you can't be right. There must be something wrong here. So I got in line, then I called up Walmart to see whether or not it was on a $4 a drug. And I said, you go to Walmart and see what it is. And sure enough, if he paid cash, it was $4. If he gave his insurance card, it was $38. He had been doing this for the last five years. It's an abomination. Somebody is ripping somebody off. Is it the drug company? Is it the insurance company? Is it the pharmacy? So I talked to my daughter, a lawyer, about this, and she said there are laws in the state of Wisconsin that the pharmacist can't tell you that it's cheaper to pay cash on. That is an abomination. They should automatically, why is not the question? Why? Because we have dumb, stupid legislators on both sides of the fence. <laughs> Come on. Who wants to sit down with any of the legislators? I don't care which tribe you're on, the right side or the wrong side. They're all dumb and stupid when they come to it. Why do they do it? Because there's big money in the industry. That's why. I mention this because this is where health education comes in just like falls. It's not just that. Because you want to make sure that you save money at the drugstore so you can go and get the walker that you need and the cane that you need. You can enjoy the exercise class that you want to have. You can have other people do that. It's part of the whole thing. It's part of the whole thing about health education. Because I just educated you and you should check and look at the $4 on Walmart and see how much, because someone in this room is overpaying for their drugs. That much I know with 100% assurity. So let me wrap this up so you can get to what you want to do. 
Number one, step number one, think. How do I improve my life? How do I improve my life? And the answer is not to fall. And you have to take action. Step number two, what action do you need to take? That's why you're here. You're learning, you're going to learn here what action you need to take. And step number three is develop your action plan. If you leave here and you don't have an action plan and you don't take action, then it's pretty much just going to the movie theater and saying thank you very much. It doesn't do any good. But action takes work and work takes hope. And the hope is that your future will be better and brighter. And that's where people actually get motivated. And I think you're all motivated because you came here. Yes, the lunch was good, but you just didn't come for the free food. So thank you very much, and good luck on your day.